Hi there and welcome to the Wednesday warm-up for everybody tuning in live. Um, today I've got a couple of fantastic guests as always. I'm joined by Scott Mitchell. How are you, Scott? Very well, Kyle. Thanks very much for having us. Good. A lot to talk about today, I'd imagine. There's certainly, as, as, as I always freak out about there not being enough content, but today I think we'll be, we'll be fine. There's plenty to talk about. And Ben, you are fresh from covering the Milk Cup for us over in Northern Ireland. How are you? And do you want to tell us a wee bit about your experience of uh, covering the, uh, the Milk Cup over there? Yeah, not too bad. I'm just wondering when your fantastic guests are getting here. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm good. Yes, so the Milk Cup uh, or the Super Cup NI, as it's as it's now called, I should call it. Um, it was good. It was uh, Rangers will probably be disappointed all in all uh, when I saw the group that they were in uh, with two county sides from Northern Ireland um, and then a team from Dublin. Um, I would have expected Rangers to be top in the group. Um, and they went through in second, uh, which means that you don't go through to the actual Super Cup. You, 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 yeah. it, it goes in this shield and globe and all these random things. Okay. Um, but it'll have been a good experience for them. Um, one player that I must say uh, stood out quite quite, quite a lot um, was Christopher Eady um, up front, who scored a hat-trick in one game. And at one point, Rangers had only four goals in the in the tournament, and he had scored them all. Um, <laughs> and really good, fin- really good finishes, I must say. Um, he's only 16. And I don't know how he's only sixteen because he's. I mean, he must be six two easily. Um, sort of, he, he, he has the he has a look of of Robbie Ure, Um, but uh, will 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 we'll, we'll be pleased with how he did, um, because around the final third, they weren't creating an awful lot, but everything they did create for him, he was managing to find the corners and, yeah, looked really good. Yeah, no, glad to hear it. So basically what you're telling us is that sh- that's the next player that Rangers should be sponsoring after our, uh, sorry, that this is Ibrook should be sponsoring at Rangers after our seemingly successful, well, so far, sponsorship of, of Thompson, Ashaka and the B team. And I will mention them every podcast because that's free goals and free games. But yeah, it sounds like you had a real fantastic time over there. And, you know, th- thanks for thanks for covering that for, for everybody, Ben. Yeah, no, um, it was really enjoyable. Fantastic. So, yeah, listen, as we said, uh, there's plenty to talk about. I think there's only one place to start, and that is it looks all but confirmed that Jose Cifuentes will be joining Rangers. Um, we're hearing it looks like it might be tomorrow, um, Friday at the latest. Uh, Beal's basically been dropping hints left, right and centre for the past uh, couple of weeks now. And I think he just as well came out in the, the open day training session yesterday and said uh, track flights into Glasgow. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's somebody out there doing that. Um, but by all accounts, he's here. Um, we'll, we'll get into his background. We'll see how he's done from LA and how he fits into this current Rangers setup. Obviously, there's rumours flying about at the minute linking Sakala to Saudi Arabia. By all accounts, it seems like he's been told that he's surplus to requirement at Rangers and he's been told to find a new club. We'll see if what we get the guy's valuation on him and, and if we think that the money that's been offered for him is fair. Um, I think we'll have to acknowledge the fact that Lee Wallace was mentioned yesterday by, by the Rangers socials, I think, since since he left, to be honest, um, which is great news, and we'll see what the guys think about that. Um, also have a wee word on the open day, and obviously we'll have a look ahead to the game against Kilmarnock. And Scott Mitchell, I believe that you are watching the, the Genk Servette game in the background for us, so we will keep everybody up to date. With, what's the scores currently on that, Scott? Uh, it's currently 1-1, one, one, it's 2 each in aggregate. Uh, there's ball boys kicking the balls across the pitch at the minute. It's an absolutely fantastic game to watch. Uh, Man sent <laughs> off the Servette, by the way, um, I should say. So Genk are probably the favourites going into the second half, but I'll keep you all posted. Fantastic. Um, but listen, Scott, I will s- stick with you. Um, on this day today is a happy 55th birthday to former Rangers player Russell Latape. He's a bit like yourself, was known a wee bit of a, a party boy at the club. Um <laughs> You're trying to say you're not a party boy? I mean, I don't think anybody at the club thinks I'm a party boy. <laughs> um, no, I, I, Russell Latape, I was doing a bit of homework in Russell Latape when, when I saw that he was on the on this day, because I knew that you would mention it tonight. Um, his probably defining characteristic as being a party boy, I think he was sacked from Hibs for doing just that, um, going out at night with White York. That's um, it. So yeah, and that's how he ended up at Rangers. My defining memory of Russell Latape, not on the pitch, um, it's when he played for Falkirk. I remember him sitting at the side on the cycling machines, getting himself warmed up to come on against Rangers. That's that's my defining memory of Ross Latipe. But yeah, probably a cult hero did maybe more off the pitch than he did on the pitch at Rangers. But, you know, he's one of these that just, I think whenever you mention him, especially to somebody like my dad's age, 
they always say he's a fantastic football player. Probably could have done a lot more in his time here, but he was what, early to mid thirties by the time we signed him, and at that point, that was that was a declining age at that point in, in football. Yeah, and and the fact the guys smoked about thirty fags a day as well, by by all accounts. So smoked them um, on the pitch, by all accounts, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, well, he could have been playing with a cigar at times, but yeah, total agreement with you there. I just. Uh, you're right, he was coming at Rangers towards the end of his career. I think he actually left us when he was about 34, 35, something like that. Um, but it's it, it was just his, it, I just loved his, his nonchalant attitude and his ability just to, he just didn't really care when he was playing football. And I always remember that there was a white Nike top, I'm sure it was, with, with NTL broadband written on it. And I, I remember a, a, a couple of people kicking about where I love that used to have, randomly used to have Latape 20 on the back of their shirts. But uh, <laughs> but there we go. Um, and look, Ben, I'll come to you next on the, the, the next on this day. Uh, it was Rangers defeated NK Maribor. I do not know how many times we've either played Malmo or Maribor in a, in a Champions League qualifying game. Um, but this occasion, Rangers scored three goals to beat Maribor 3-1. Tori Andre Flo, there's a name. And um, we're sticking with the sort of South American theme today. So Claudio Canigia got the other two. What was your memories of, of Claudio Canigia in a Rangers shirt? Oddly, another guy who came to Rangers towards the end of his career. Yeah, um, I mean, again, it's sort of the 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 word cult hero sort of comes uh, comes to mind as well. Um, I was surprised when when I when you said to me about it um, on this day, I had a look as well, and I was surprised actually that he only played two seasons. It felt felt like he was longer with us. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know why, but yeah, another another player sort of similar to Cifuentes in terms of being South American and also having played at a World Cup. Um, he played it too um so so another link there um but yeah i mean a, a wonderful player the, the the biggest question is what the hell was he ever doing at dundee um but but yeah um you know fond memories and uh, it's a shame we didn't get him a bit earlier than we did yeah fantastic i mean it's just i still it still blows my mind when some of these like nostalgic 90s you know things come up on on twitter or whatever and it's like claudio canigia looking 18 years old with his golden locks playing for for Argentina um, and just the fact that he was still kicking about in 2001 for, for Rangers, it just shows you what a, what a career he had. And yeah, another guy, another South American that I was happy to see playing in a Rangers shirt. But um, Scott, I'll, I'll start with you here. Um, as I said, there's, there's only one place to start tonight and that is um, in the next couple of days, Jose Cifuentes will be uh, unveiled as a Rangers player. As I said, Beal's been hinting at for a couple of, of weeks now. Um, and as I said, yesterday was talking about the incoming flights to Glasgow. Um, a player that I've seen described as the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, uh, puzzle which is a pretty, pretty um, good compliment to get before, <laughs> before you've joined the club. But just overall, how excited are you to have uh, Ecuador international Jose Cifuentes joining, joining Rangers Football Club? Um, I think, see, if you'd asked me about two months ago when these rumours started, I'd have been absolutely buzzing. I am just, uh, it's been done in my head for that long now that I'm no longer yeah. excited about it. It's just a, it's a formality. Um, I've been a big fan of this when I actually, this is this is where I get my excitement from. I signed him for his on, on football manager at the start of the season <laughs> and it was an absolute revelation. Um, and since he's been linked with us, I've just been so excited. I've been watching games. Um, I've been looking at his stats. He just looks like a different, calibre and type of football than what we've got in that midfield currently. I think if you look at him compared to someone like Raskin, even someone like Kieran Dow, who's just come in and a word on Kieran Dow for just a second has been a revelation, I think. I think he looked brilliant in that midfield. Um, Jose, yeah, Jose Sifuentes just looks like the big powerhouse, the uh, midfield of the big box-to-box -box powerhouse that we really need. He's going to allow players like Nico Raskin just to sit that little bit deeper, do what they do a lot better, and without having to break forward as much. Jose Sifuentes for me very, very excited. Just really want it over and done with now because it's been dragging on for so long. It does feel like about two months since the rumours first started. Yeah, and, and Ben, I'll, I'll ask you a very similar question before we sort of dig into the bones behind the the player profile of Jose Cifuentes, but just how excited are you to have a, a, a guy, a, you know, another South American player in the, as many days coming to coming to Rangers, you know, seems to have a real pedigree, doing well in a, in a half-decent league in the MLS. How are you excited are you for, for this addition to the squad? Yeah, it doesn't seem long ago that uh, all the talk was over oh, only signing players from the Championship in England, and, and now we've got, you know, an Ecuadorian and a Brazilian coming in. Um, which is great. 
you know, and I, I think it's gonna it's gonna benefit us in, in so many ways. Um, but but I, I'm very excited for this type of player, for this profile of player. Um, I'm also excited for the fact that it's something that we've been talking about for so long and you know, sometimes these rumors will just sort of disappear or whatever. But you know, something that the club will follow through and and, and got and it's it's a real it's a coup for the club. You know, the age profile. You know, he's an international. Um, he seems to be what something a little bit different, as Scott said there. Um, that that we, that we need in the midfield. We need we need that little bit of variety in there. Um, because I feel like for the last few years we've had too much that have been very similar, and can do similar things. Um, and and you know, if he's to go so far. The two the two midfielders that came in in, in Campwell and Raskin, you know, and again at low fees, and this is another one at low fee, um, that that's come in, and and if they're anything on on what Bale has brought in so far, if he if he lives up to that, you know, it's a fantastic addition, um, and and credit credit to Bale for identifying whoever's identified these three players as well to be able to get them. Um, you know, because if these players have two, three years left in their contracts, you know, Rangers are they're they're out of the market for us. There's there's no chance we're getting them. You know, so to be able to bring in those type of players, I think, I think it's fantastic. And, you know, it's it's very exciting times. Yeah, I think you've hit on a fantastic point there in terms of I was expecting this transfer window to be a lot of players from the championship. And it is nice to see that we're, we're looking at further afield in, in terms of uh, LAFC and, and bringing guys over uh, from the MLS. But, Scott, the, the next point that I, I, I'll ask you here is... How good a deal do you think this is for Rangers, given that, okay, we know that it's well documented that it's been grown for a long, long time. Bill revealed a, a, a few weeks ago that uh, he'd actually signed him on a, a pre-contract. Um, but by all accounts, it looks like it's a four-year deal um, worth about £1.2 million. Pounds, uh, and a guy who I've seen his, his real term value being at about £12 to £10 million. Pounds. I know you can, you can make of that what you will, but... Um, uh, the, all that and convincing a guy to move from LA to Govan, it's it's no mean feat. So what have you made of the deal earlier on? And, and has something happened in that other game by the looks of your face? Because I, I don't see you reacting to my chat like that very often. No, I'm I'm, I'm listening to both, mate. Um, so Genk have just went 2-1 up. Um, I think it's going to be VAR, so I'll let you know the update on that once it's sorted. I've not got the volume on, so I can't actually hear what's going on. Cracking head at the back post, though. Um, so Fuentes, for me, is a cracking deal. See, for 1.2 million, I think we're getting a, a player who's a Venezuelan international, am I right in saying that? That's that's his, his, his Ecuador of origin. Ecuador, same thing. Um, so I we're getting an international here for the MLS, and the MLS isn't a backwater league any longer. It's 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 no a, a third rate league. It's probably comparable with something like the SPL, especially if you look at the, the quality spread throughout. Um, it's probably stronger than a lot of the SPL teams. So we're getting a cracking player on effectively, you know, a, a, a cut price deal, similar to what Ben was saying. We can't well, you know, you're getting that player in for not a lot of money. If we're going to flip this player for two in two years' time and get close anywhere close to 12 million, it's a smashing deal. Uh, we're going to come on and talk about potentially players like Fashion Sakala later. And we need to be looking at doing the same for them. So this is the player trading model that was oft talked about at Rangers, but never came to fruition under the the, the failed sporting director, um, who shall remain nameless on the rest of this pod. Um so I think it's going to be a smashing deal, regardless of how he performs on the pitch we're probably going to make a return on this investment regardless of the situation but I do think he's going to be a player that could stick around for a few years do the business and you know then we, we flip for hopefully close to the 10 million as you said yeah that that's that exactly it's we have to get into this player trading model and and I think he fits sort of similar into the Nico Raskin he's somebody that we've obviously the club's had an eye on for for a wee while here and and hopefully it's it, it's buy low and, and and sell high isn't it and and yeah and if we get a good few years out of them in between then then it's all that's all part of the plan. But um, Ben, look, well, having looked at a few scouting reports of uh, Sifuentes, uh, the word that keeps coming up or is box-to-box -box midfielder. He's been described as, as having excellent vision and it's not often I look and, and delve into the stats and stuff like that. But uh, I was quite impressed by that. His, his actions lead to about four and a half sh shots uh, a game per 90 minutes, which is pretty good. Uh, and he said he's also got an eye for, for a shot at goal as well and he gets about two two shots away uh, every game as well. Last year, I think he scored, or 
the MLS isn't season obviously hasn't completed yet. I think there's been twenty odd twenty, maybe thirty games in there so far, but he scored twice and assisted five in twenty six games. Um how do you feel a player like this with his profile will, will, will fit into this this Rangers squad? Um, I think, I mean, I, I, like I said, I haven't seen a massive, massive amount of him. But I think, as I said, it's something different in that midfield that, that can do. I mean, we have a lot that can kind of now break up the play and things like that. But I feel that he is almost what John Lundstrom should have been and hasn't really lived up to in terms of getting that box-to-box element. Now, whether that's, to be fair to Lundstrom, with that, uh, that at the start when he first came in, he wasn't really played in that role uh, enough. Um, or some would say we didn't use him correctly, but I, I feel like Sifuentes is something that can sort of just keep us ticking, ticking along and can um, create those opportunities that maybe, maybe a, a sort of more pragmatic midfield that we have had of late just doesn't doesn't manage to and, and given the fact that we've got players like that can't well in there um to be able to, to link up with them or or the um Sammers as as he's become known now um <laughs> also um is he is able to to benefit off and, and you know we have got new a new front line so having somebody in there that is able to uh create is to able to make opportunities and, and, and isn't afraid to have a shot himself um is something that we need. Um, and, and by all accounts, from what I've seen, which isn't, again, as I said, a whole lot, but he's, he's able to do the, the dirty work and the defensive work as well. Um, so when he seems to be the whole package. Yeah, that, that's that's it. I mean, in, in terms of, um, again, having a look closely at him here, and I'll come on to you for, for the next wee point here, Scott. Um, it said that, that that's maybe the part of his game that, that's, that's not as strong as, as the defensive side of things. Um, I've seen that his 1v1 uh, you know, take-ons with opponents is, is very good in terms of going forward and defending. Oddly enough, he there was a stat, uh, he's got he's like in the 98th percentile in the world for, for aerial headers. I think he's going to be another massive unit that, that, that fits into this team as well. Um, but again, his strengths deeper seems to be from us transitioning into the attack Um and how exciting is it to have you know this potential linking up with with all the new signings that we've we've got in so far as well? And, and are you surprised to see that, that Beals brought in another absolute unit <laughs> to the squad? Um, no, I don't. I'm not surprised at all on the absolute unit. I think we were very very lightweight going into the few seasons before. You look at players like Glenn Kamara and their profile. Um, we struggled in a physical battle against a lot of different teams. Teams could come to Ibrox and set up. Um, very, very deep, and we would struggle to break that down. Having a physical player in there, we've got, now got more than one, it's going to make it a lot easier for us to try and break down those um, those defensive blocks. Um, in terms of his, def- his defensive worries, if you call it that, I'm not concerned by it at all. I think we've got players like Nico Raskin in there who can really show up a defence, mm-hmm. can do all the, the, the covering and the dirty work. That, that players like Sifuentes and Cantwell and are going to need even, again, I know I've been going about him twice now and I've not been asked a direct question about him. <laughs> Kieran Dowell can come in and do that as well. Um, so I think we just let the midfield players do what they do best. Nico Raskin can show everything up, get the ball moving, and then give it off to players like Cantwell and to Sifuentes to do the, you know, the hard work further up the pitch. And I think that's probably where we're going to be better. We just start trusting players to, to do what they can do. And I think we're going to you know, sort of see the benefits of that. We have to remember, though, I think it's pro- probably best that we temper expectations. We're going into this season where an effectively front uh, front and middle is completely changed. Defence is probably each peachy for last season. It's, it's much the same. But we need to give a little bit of time for these players to gel. Players like Cantwell and Raskin, brilliant. They had that six months. But Sifuentes, he's going to take a bit of time to get the ball rolling, especially since he's coming off of effectively three quarters of a season in the MLS. Um, and... I think we looked at a stat a few months ago, Kyle, or a few weeks ago, where he played for LA Galaxy one night and then two nights later he was playing international games. The boy's an absolute unit, but we need to give him time to run his motor down a wee bit and then get him back up and ready. So it could be a couple or a few weeks into the season before we see the best of Jose Fuentes, I think. Yeah, Scott, you've you've led me on to my next point really, really nicely there for, for Ben. You know, uh, Scott's told us what he thinks here about, about the... About him not having a preseason, but do you share any concerns, or do you have any concerns that he's not got a preseason? Um, and and do you, what do you think? Do you think he'll just basically go straight into the squad, or do you think like Scott, there'll be a few weeks before he's he's fully integrated into the Rangers first team? 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not overly worried about the whole not having a preseason because he's basically in this season. Um, I'm worried. Well, not worried, but I feel that. I agree with Scott in terms of I don't think he can be just thrown straight in. Um, the only way that I see us potentially doing that would be if we needed him for a second leg of the Champions League um, qualifiers. But then he may come back out again. Um, you know, it may be using him just at this moment in time when when needed until he's sort of settled in and adjusted. Um, but I, 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 if he was to go in soon and stay in, he's going to need a break at some point because he's basically had you know his season and is coming straight into us so i think i think we we've got to sort of temper our expectations i think he's going to be a brilliant player and asset but i think there is going to come a point where we're going to have to we're going to have to be clever about how we use him but but this is why it's it's good um it's another reason why it's good to have a sign in like this as well because it, it not only are we going to be able to pick and choose because we have options now we're going to be able to choose how to integrate him when to use him when not but it's also less pressure on the likes of ryan jack you know you could you could have ryan jack used a little bit less if you've got if you've got these options as opposed to what we've had before um but yeah i think that i think that i don't think it's in any way realistic to expect him to just come in hit the ground running and, and stay there for the rest of the season i think he's going to take time um it's a shame we didn't get him in a couple of weeks ago but you know we are where we are and i i feel i feel that you know given time and given patience which is something that we we sometimes struggle you know with as a fan base um as do all football fans but i think you know i think that if we're patient you know we, we've got a real gem on our hands <laughs> Yeah, did you just assume the Rangers supporters are going to be patient there, Ben? Because that's a that's a big, <laughs> big, big assumption there. But um, yeah, it, it, there's a couple of comments coming in here. Stephen Faye says that uh, Sif went his last game was was ten days ago, I think. So I suppose he is having a wee break. And RFC seventy two says, you know, very similar. A wee break from is probably the best case scenario. Let him char- recharge the batteries and be ready to go straight away. Um, look, Scott. The the next question here is I don't want to say it's off topic, but it's it's something that I think is, is important to mention here and is how do you think Beal's experience as a coach, um, especially at, at Sao Paulo, I think he was assistant manager at Sao Paulo for a couple of years and how important is that going to be um, to, to help a guy like Sifuentes integrate into the squad because I know it's been you know banded about in the past, that especially South Americans, even though we've had quite a few successful ones. You look at Morelos, um, Amato, Kanija, who we've mentioned there, um, but obviously we've brought in Danilo and Sifuentes this year. How important do you think his understanding of, of sort of South American culture is going to help them, you know, settle in Scotland and play in the SPFL? Um, I think for Danilo, it might be a bigger. Um, a, a bigger thing for him than it is going to be for Sifuentes. Um, Beal obviously speaks or understands a, a wee bit of Portuguese, so he's going to be, have that that language barrier is not going to be there between the two players. Um, for Sifuentes, I'd imagine his main language is Spanish, I'd, I'd probably assume, based on si. where he's from. <laughs> si, senor, thank you, yes. Um, so I, I don't know how much that's going to have, and I don't know what the cultural differences are between um, Ecuador and Brazil, but I'd imagine they're as vast as between Scotland and England. So I don't know if it's going to have much of an influence on True. on him. But we have now got probably a multinational backroom, uh, not backroom, sorry, a multinational squad where players should be able to come in and fit in with a little bit of ease. I don't imagine, based on everything that the players that have signed already have said about Bill. Bill will have done his homework. He'll know that Jose Sifuente is going to fit into this Rangers squad. And it's 2-2, by the way, so I've just equalised. Oh. Um, there we go, breaking news. Uh, might go to VAR. But Jose Sifuente is, I don't know how much an influence that's going to have on him. Um, and we can just close off with that. I think that was fair enough. That was a, a very, very diplomatic answer there, Scott Matrona. I take my hat off to you for that one. Um, but look, I think that the last question I'll ask you, Ben, just before we, we move on to topics um, other than Jose Cifuentes, but... Um, it's been touched on a wee bit there by Scott Mitchell. He thinks he'll link up well with, with Raskin and Dowell in particular. What other players do you think that he will link up with? And and how do you think that all the Rangers midfielders are going to be kept happy? And I'm just going to bring up this wee comment. Um, here was it here. Where was it there? It was, uh, there we go. It's William there says, what I've seen of Sifuentes, he linked up with Vela really well. I think he could do the same with Danilo. And that is a very, very exciting prospect and something that I hadn't considered before. But, but what combinations can you see linking up well with, with Jose coming in? 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose it depends on where we play him. Um, I, I feel like we, he's being brought in for us to play that wee bit deeper. Um, and therefore, I maybe see him linking up with the number 10s as opposed to being that number 10, um, mm-hmm. which, which he's been. Um, but I, I feel that at this minute in time, Lammers would certainly be a player that I'd, li- I'd be interested to see him linking up with. Um, you know, Lammers has really, really impressed me. Yeah. Um, so so I'd like to see that. I mean, certainly Danilo too. D- depend on depend on how we're playing, what we're playing. Um, you know, if if say we were playing Danilo that little bit off off Dessers, then then you'd be looking at them to be linking up there. Um, again, Todd Cantwell linking up with a player of this ability as well. Raskin, you know, um, I I think Kieran Dial has really really impressed me as well. Um, you know, which is not something I expected. Um, but you know, his work work rate, his his tenacity, getting stuck in has really impressed me. Um, and, and maybe he's the type of player that could be in there and could allow um Sufuentes to, to get forward a bit more and be be linking up that further bit up the f- up the field. Um but yeah, I think I think with a variety of players that'll be able to link up. And I mean good good players are like Sufuentes are gonna make those around them much better. Um you know, so even if it's Ryan Jack in there, I, you know, I always feel like Ryan Jack makes the players around him a lot better because he, he, he gives them that cover. Um, but it's it's going to be difficult, I think, to, to keep them all happy. Um, although with the likes of Ryan Jack, uh, he, if, if he's fit, then then fair enough. But, you know, if, if he ends up injured again, um, keeping him happy won't be a problem, will it? But um, I'm hoping yeah. that's not the case. Yeah, that's exactly... Uh... <sighs> I'm trying not to mention the words injuries at all in any of these sort of podcasts before we get into the the season proper. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think there's potential there that he could link up well with with a number of players in our squad. And and as you said, especially if we're going to be having sort of two wide tens, as as it's called, I think that's where his his key positioning lies and and supporting them. But look, listen, I think we could talk about Sifuentes for the whole podcast, but I'm going to change it on to something different here, Scott Mitchell, and that is um, a a player that's, I don't think I've known a player in a long time to have polarised the Rangers support so much in fashion, Sakala Jr. Uh, There's, you know, there's both uh, ends of the spectrum here in, in this podcast with people that absolutely love him and then you've got people like Scott Patterson that just want him out of the club as, as quickly as possible um, but by all accounts it's been told that he's he, or he's been told to, to look for a new club it, it looks like it, yesterday I think it was rumoured about 3 million I think we're seeing figures around about 4 million sort of emerging in the last sort of few hours here but where do you value a player like Fashion Sakala especially considering I think one of the key things is that he's got about, I think it's 38 goal assists and about 60 odd games for Rangers, which is crazy numbers for me. It's mental numbers, um, genuinely. And I think if if any team were to look at Fashion Sakala just based on numbers, then they'd think, wow, we're getting an absolute steal here if, if the figure is 4 million. As soon as you watch Fashion Sakala for more than five minutes, you realise maybe 4 million isn't a bad deal. I think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. Um, everybody's thoughts here. I know it is polarising opinions. I've got a, I've got a couple of pals who absolutely despise Fashion Sakala. I'm on the fence a wee bit. I think his his productiveness, as you've mentioned already, there is is probably second to probably none in last season's squad. If I'm totally honest, he was the player who was getting us the goals when the goals were drying up. Um, aside from Cantwell, obviously there is, but I'd be happy to see him go for four million pounds i think that's probably a fair figure considering we got the guy for free let's be honest we're flipping him for four million pounds we're getting rid of a player who isn't he going to set the world alight at rangers anytime his name is mentioned i just remember the two absolute sitters against celtic um so i'd be happy to see him go for four million but i would also miss him yeah, that's it as well. I can't believe you've not mentioned the hat-trick against Motherwell in the 6-1 game. Surely that's got to be up there when you think of fashion Sakala. No. <laughs> no, at all. No, no, I'm I'm in total agreement with you. When when you when you do mention the name fashion Sakala, it's normally the next thing that come out of people's mouth is how did he not score those two open goals against against the other half of the city, basically. But Ben, you know, I'm a bit conflicted about this myself. When, when you look at the numbers, they are phenomenal, but he's, I have never been frustrated as much in my life at a player that, that, that's played at Ibrox. But then again, on the other hand, I've been very critical of the club in, on previous podcasts saying about this the player trading model um, and, and how we need to keep that going. But this surely is exactly the type of 
of sort of flips that we've not been making in the past few years is buying somebody in or getting somebody in for free, having them play for Rangers a couple of seasons. And okay, he's not going to be a, a Calvin Bassey, a, a 20, 25 million pound transfer player. Uh, I don't think anybody was expecting that, but three, four million, is that is that about right for Sakala? And, and do you think that we should let him go for that? My valuation of Sakala changes every 15 minutes that he's on the pitch because he'll do something brilliant and then he'll run off and hit, run into the corner flag or something. Yeah. Um, you know, but do I think three million is enough? No, I don't. Um, given those, I mean, I, I'm personally, I'm happy to happy to see him leaving. Um, I think that we're trying to move on from the the the, the sort of period of, of failure, really. Um, and trying to trying to move on, and, and when I think of them, I I think of those two open open goal misses in in, in the biggest games for us, um, and and those are failures essentially. Um, you know, we, we we could be sitting with with one or two trophies if if those simple things had gone in. And, and can you rely on them? No, you can't. He can do things that that make him look brilliant, but but most of the time, you're thinking no. No, and even even I am watching some of the friendlies there when he came on against Newcastle. There was a couple of things where he just was running, like I don't know where he, he doesn't know where he's going himself when he's running with a ball. <laughs> um, so so no, um, I think I think given his numbers and given the market that we're looking at, the Saudi market where everything's inflated, I think three million is not enough. Um, you know, at the same time, get, get get a player in for free and moving them on and making decent profit is good for a player that's not going to impact us and is not going to play. I can't see how he features at all. Um, you know, I think Seaman's ahead of him now as well. Um, so I don't I don't see so where he comes in. I'd be looking at maybe four four and a half million, and and I'd be happy enough. Um, and 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 I think it's 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 good business, and I think it's it's time for him to move on. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's where a, a lot of the support are. Um, other than the ones that, that's basically willing them to to drive them to to Saudi Arabia themselves. But Scott Stephen nineteen here says I like fashion, but let's be honest, we need a guy who would take the chances. He missed chances against Celtic. We will win nothing again if he's the kind that player we are relying on. Three million pounds is good business, and really hard to disagree with anything you've said there. But it brings me on to to my next point, Scott Mitchell here, and and it's almost like RFC 72 has been having a wee look at my agenda for tonight, but he says if we get rid of Sakala, uh, Matondo, right, do we bring in a, a left wing for some width with Sima on the other side? Where does this leave? I mean, it, look, it all but looks like Scott Wright's another one that's going to be out the door. Obviously, we'd agreed a, a 500k fee for uh, Scott Wright with I, I can't I cannot pronounce that Turkish t- uh, team's name but um, th- if we sell Sakala to me that only leaves us with Matondo <laughs> who's got a bit of pace um, in there is this a Rangers now going to have to go out and get another player or or is this or where do you lie in this whole whole uh, issue here? Um, I think firstly Scott Wright will be going to someone spore probably that will be the the name of the, the team that he goes for. Um, no, I don't think we really do. I think one of the, the, the big proponents of the Rangers under Gerard, if we all want to think back to that, was the, the two wide tens. And despite the fact we don't have a lot of wingers, Matondo would be the last one probably that I could think of. We've got lots of players that could play in that wide ten role. Todd Cantwell, Kieran Dowell. Bill mentioned in his last interview that these players all want to play a bit more forward in the forward line. So we could potentially move to two tens, uh, sorry, three tens and two white tens as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think we do need to go and get any more forward line um, players, if I'm totally honest. I think after this, the, the thing that we probably want, and I, I, it looks like the manager wants, is probably a left-sided centre-half, potentially some reinforcements in the, at the left-back position as well. So I wouldn't expect too much in the attacking front unless it's going to be a loan for someone later on in the, in the English Premier League, someone, someone late into the window. That that will probably be the last um, potential attack investments for us. I don't think we need that. If I'm totally honest, we've played with wingers now for two seasons. We can call it, um, yeah. and it it didn't really work. If I'm totally honest, and I'd be quite happy to see the back of them and never see any wingers again after after Ryan Kent departed Rangers. 
Yeah, again, I think I think that's fair enough. I, th- I think um, we are going to play a completely different way to what we finished to sort of end the last season and, and even the last couple of years. I wonder if we're more akin to 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 the style that that Gerard played under, given that obviously Bill was the assistant manager back then. But we will we will find out in a few days' time for sure. Um, but look, the last question I've got Ben and surrounding all this and, and Aldo the sniper McNaught brings me onto it quite nicely. He said Sakala's numbers are great, but if the money as what's being said, then take it and put that money into the centre back position. I I I think that Rangers might still be looking at a centre back. Um, what what do you think about this, and do you think that this money will be reinvested back into the squad? Yeah, we absolutely have to be looking at a centre back. I think we're looking at a centre back, whether Sakala goes or not. Um, and I think if if you were to say now you can keep Sakala and not have a centre back. Which which adds more value to our team, or, or which is more important for our team right now, and uh, and centre back is without doubt gonna gonna be more beneficial to us. Um, I think it's it's very important, and I think that's that's a good point Aldo makes. Um, so yeah, we we need a centre back. There's no doubt about it. Um, defensively, we haven't been wonderful. Granted, um, our our best, well, our at least equal to best centre back with Suter, um, Golson hasn't been available for the whole of preseason, so it's 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 a bit false. Um, but at the same time, we definitely need reinforcements. You know, we've got Golson, who everyone's saying, oh, Golson will be back soon, but he, he was out for quite a period last season, and, and you know, he could come back and be out again, um, and, and and if that is the case, we, we are not equipped um, to deal with that over for a long-term basis. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see over over the next month um, if we do bring another centre back, uh, especially since Beals say, uh, said it before, and 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 I'm, I still can't get those comments out my head after that Hoffenheim game where he says Rangers finishing a game with no fit centre halves is a scenario that we could face during the season, which I didn't I don't want to hear him say something like that again. But um, again, just just to change topic here, Scott, and and something that I must say, I was really 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 happy uh, with the club on this point yesterday. It was obviously the first official day that James Bisgrove's taken up the mantle of Rangers CEO uh, and it was a very, very interesting social media announcement that I certainly wasn't expecting, but the club wished former Rangers captain Lee Wallace a happy birthday. A man who, in my opinion, regardless of what's going on behind the scenes, deserves recognition of the club and and I, I don't know if I'm just putting two and two together, but it's nice to see that the new CEO's come in something that a lot of Rangers supporters have been asking for for a long time but uh, certainly guys like like you and I we are of that generation that Lee Wallace did mean a lot to us and, and was a guy that, that stuck by the club are you happy that the club finally gave him some recognition on social media? 100% um, I put out what I thought was a very clever comment on my Twitter uh, make sure you give us a follow guys there's a lot of great stuff over there um, but obviously I, I soon realised that everybody else had the same thought the club has finally acknowledged Lee Wallace's existence after what is it five six years easily um, I think it's been quite disgusting how Lee Wallace has been treated um, the man is a, an ex-Rangers captain regardless of what happened and the, the sort of acrimonious terms of his leaving Kenny Miller is now recognised by the club and has been for a while um, it was almost three two gank there, ball cleared off the line. Um, so I believe that Lee Wallace should have had some sort of acknowledgement prior to this. But you're right, there's been a few departures at boardroom level that potentially meant that it was fair game to mention Lee Wallace again. For me, he won't go down as a Rangers legend. That's a different debate that anybody can get into, <laughs> right? He won't. Um, but he's definitely. Um, maybe an echelon just below that for me. I think Lee Wallace is a fantastic yeah. servant to Rangers Football Club. He could have went and played at a higher level. He stuck with the club when when fans, some of whom have returned to Rangers, um, walked out quicker than the door would open. Um, so I was a bit disgusted with how we treated Lee Wallace over the last few years. Rangers hero is probably the right way to put it, Pete. Let, let's be honest. I Rangers hero, maybe not a legend. Fantastic servant to the club. Um, made money off the club, absolutely, but every player that that, that comes to Rangers does, and I, I think it's good that we're finally acknowledging the guy. I really want to get him back to Rangers next season, uh, sorry, at the, at the end of next season when when fifty six is getting lifted, and I hope Lee Wallace plays some part in that. Yeah, again, fantastic answer you've given there, Scott. I think I agree with you. I think Pete Lawrence has summed it up quite nicely there. He is a Rangers hero. It's it, you know you often find that a lot of guys 
come to Rangers and and you know it benefits their career. But I think in this instance, he he sacrificed his career to continue playing for Rangers Football Club. And I do not think there are many players that we've had under our 151, 52 year history that 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 it can they can honestly say that about. So yeah, I take my hat off to to Lee Wallace, and yeah, I'm glad the club finally gave him a bit of recognition that he deserved. Um, club seem to be doing a lot off the pitch really well at the moment, Ben. Let's hope that it continues into the new season. But just something I want to touch on before we get into the, the sort of Kamarnock game uh, is the Rangers held the first team open day training session at Ibrox. There was loads of activities for, for some of the younger bears there. There was face painting, you know, food. I think there was activities with, with footballs and sort of wee skill challenges and stuff like that by all accounts. I know that some of the guys that are in the, the wider... This is Ibrook's uh, group uh, took their, their kids to it and, and days like this are exactly what it's all about. But how important are, you know, things like this to and cementing the next generation of, of Ranger supporters? And, and why didn't the club do something like this when we were wee guys, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think I think absolutely um, crucial. Um, you know, I, I think they're great. I think they're wonderful PR exercises. Um, and I think, you know, they, they do. I mean, I'd, I would have loved to have obviously been over and been closer and be able to take my daughter um, because it's just, it's how, how kids nowadays fall in love with a club, you know. They, they just, kids need, kids nowadays, I, I feel like they need a wee bit of entertainment. They don't, they're not, they're too distracted by just, the kind of, just football doesn't quite get them at a certain age um, when they get a, get a wee bit older, but they need they need the whole package, um, which that sort of sort of is, you know, with the, with the fun element, with the skills, things and all that. And just then they're associating Rangers with fun and they're associating, associating with, with a good time. Um, and, and that's that's what we want. And, and basically, you know, I think I think it's brilliant. I think the clubs should Consider maybe doing something again um, at a later stage within within the season on, you know, sort of maybe um, be it the winter break, maybe try and do something. I understand that some of the players aren't there at that stage. It doesn't have to be necessarily a training session. It doesn't have to be that. But just to try and, you know, continually engage with, with fans of, of, of all generations. But to make it to make it a family a family day. And I'm sure, you know, also you bring that many people again to, to it. And, you know, I'm sure the shop did pretty well out of the day as well. So, you yeah. know, it's win-win, isn't it? Yeah, and, and in terms of you, you know, thinking about, uh, is there any specific locations, Windsor Park, that you're thinking of that Rangers should host a, a, a training session at next, Ben? Yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't mind at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a football ground around the corner from me here if they want to come. You know, <laughs> uh, but no. Uh, I mean, if I put it this way, if the if they did were if they were to hold something in Northern Ireland, I mean, it'd be sold out in ten minutes. You know, as well. So. Um, just to be able to engage with, with you know, because not uh, you know things are getting more costly. And not a, not all families can afford to always go over and things like that. So yeah. to be able to just engage with that fan base, which is which is great. And you know, I, I don't just mean Northern Ireland. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased on that, but um, but but all over the place. I mean, there's Rangers fans everywhere. So you know, to be to be able to continually engage, I think would be brilliant. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that one there, and and it was good to see Rangers sending their their B team out for for a number of of pre season sort of friendlies before the before the best v best team, and I, and I know there was there was a lot of Rangers supporters and and your neck of the woods went over and, and watched those games as well, um, but Scott, just you know, last question again before we get into you know the sort of Kamarnock side of things, but I mean, it seems this year that Rangers have done quite a lot of stuff. That's that's landed really really well with the with the support um, off the pitch. New Edson House, you know the announcement of this museum, the fans forum, the open day, um, and and obviously there's loads of other stuff as well. Is this just all part of you know the sort of new Rangers and, and the new boardroom of that have come through? And have you been impressed by a lot of the stuff that we, we've done off the pitch so far? Got to be careful we're using the term new rangers because that might set off a few people in the chat um, <laughs> yeah, through that but absolutely no i think so we we managed to get a an, an exclusive interview with, with jim uh, with um stuart roberts no not stuart robertson stuart gibson. stuart gibson um yes at the tail end of last season and stuart spoke quite positively um about the the new chairman um john bennett yeah and i think this is all 
pretty much in line with what Stuart was saying about him, about John Bennett really is there for the fans. John Bennett really isn't in this for himself. He wants to make Rangers the best version of itself that it can be. And I think the appointment of James Bisgrove into and a CEO or see whatever it is that he's doing these days. Mm-hmm. Um, that started off yesterday officially, and then that's where the Lee Wallace thing came from. This is what the new Rangers is going to mm-hmm. look like. We're going to be a fan, a family friendly, a fan friendly sort of club going forward. Now it's not going to be a us against them. It's not going to be a you know we're we're not going to do what the fans want us to do. We're trial and singing sections. We've got the yeah. the fan days. Everything just seems to be going well. Uh, we're probably going to administration next week. Um, <laughs> but I know. Um, so we just need to keep pushing forward in this direction. It's going right. If the season goes well, really they're already a winner. And I don't see how they can mess this up. But I think we've all said that before when it comes to Rangers. Yeah, that's that as well. I said, I just. I think it's just important, you know, just to take a wee step back at the moment and just give credit to the club and, and all the good off the field things that they have done. Despite a disappointing season last year, I've been very encouraged with it. And I think, you know, all the feel good factor off the pitch can only lead to, you know, help the, the team on it as well. If all the supporters are are buzzing and all singing from the same hymn sheet and they're, and they're happy, then hopefully that reflects back onto the players. But um, look, Ben, let's get into the uh, Kamarnock game at the weekend. Obviously, a bit of a weird kickoff time for, for TV. It's uh, quarter past five on Saturday, the 5th of August. Um, Kamarnock technically had their season underway, having had three or four games in the, in the Scottish League Cup group stages. Uh in terms of Kilmarnock, they seem to have brought in a couple of ex-Aberdeen players, which is absolutely no surprise given who their manager is. They brought in uh, Matty Kennedy, who I always thought was okay for Aberdeen, and, and Marley Watkins as well. They brought back Stuart Finlay uh, on loan from Oxford, who used to be on their books as well as a centre-half, and obviously they bought uh, Lewis Mayo from Rangers as well. Firstly, what are you expecting on the opening day of the season from a, from a Derek McInnes team? Physicality um, yeah. is, is what you expect from a Derek McInnes team. Um, well organised, um, good good set pieces um, is, is what you really expect from from a Derek McInnes team. I actually saw Kilmarnock there played Linfield over here in a friendly, yeah. um, and they were absolutely terrible. Um, it was Linfield beat them one nil. Um, it was going on going on six really, um, but I mean. Preseason friendlies, as we've already said, don't don't necessarily tell the whole story. Um, but I really, really expect them to, to be in our faces and to be to be physical and, and and to be hard to break down. Really, is what 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 you expect from them. Um, but that's what we really are going to expect for ninety nine percent of the season, isn't it? That's it exactly. And and Scott Mitchell, are you expecting you know much of the same against Kamarnock, big physical side? And you know it's certainly one thing that's been levelled at Rangers this year that we are now also a, a very big physical side. And how do you see see that lining up? And are you excited to uh, for us to put our test against sort of hammer swingers first first game of the season? Yeah, so I think in terms of how we will be able to match up against Kelly, I think we're now better equipped than we've ever been for sort of these first day. Um, games, I think we're going to be able to combat the hammer throws that they've brought in um, from Aberdeen, <laughs> especially. I'm not especially worried about Kelly. Um, we, we mentioned earlier on about the potential of her struggling at the centre back area. Uh, Kilmarnock have got like one half decent striker and in, in the boy Vassell, um, and then their next best striker is somebody called Bobby Wales. Never heard there. Um, so I don't see us having too much problem there. Watch them beat us one nil. Um, but I think we'll be a lot better equipped. I think we just need to hit the ground running. And the f- opening six to eight games minus the old firm game should hopefully be pretty easy sailing for us. We've been dealt a pretty simple card. Um, and if we can hit the ball running and can I take maximum points for the majority of these games, then we don't deserve to win the league. Realistically, I'd expect us to go into September with, with maximum points, hopefully. Um, but this game in itself... I'm going to go for an early prediction here, Kyle. You've not asked me yet, but I'm going to say 3-1 Rangers. Oh, that, I'd, listen, I'd, I'd take that all day long. I think uh, Ross and myself were were at the last Kilmarnock game, and it, I think that was the score the, the last time. So so I'd, I would absolutely love it if that was the case. But Ben, look, in terms of team lineups going into the Kelly game, uh, it's not been confirmed yet, obviously. Looking at the defence, that's the sort of first area I want to look at. I'm, I'm just assuming we're all going to say Butlin's playing in goals. 
right? That's McGregor for me. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I said, there's, I know there's some members of the support that would still have him back in there. So, um, yeah, but um, it, I think the defence, I think that's the bit we could hardly spend the, the longest amount talking about team lineup. Um, myself, I've gone for Tavit right back, Suter, Davies, and, and and I don't want him playing at left back, but I, I think we will go with Parasic at left back. Um, how do you think the defence will line up? I, I'm, I'm the same as you. I think. I would play Ilmaz, but I think he will play. Uh, he will play Borna, um, just because he's tried and tested there, um, played on that pitch, and you know Ilmaz is still plenty to to improve on and learn. Um, so yeah, I, I think probably the same as you. I've gone for the same centre backs because Golson's far too early for, um, and especially you don't want to come have him come in uh, play now, even if he was you know eighty percent ready, and then and then potentially pick up a knock and be out of the Champions League game. So yeah, same defence as you really. Um, that's what I think. No, that's fair enough. And and Scott Mitchell, we did see Goldson involved in training yesterday. And as as always with with social media rumours, I know a certain Reese posted something into the the infamous this is Ibrox WhatsApp chat earlier on. And it was a guy who'd obviously met Connor Goldson out and about in Glasgow, and he said that he hopes to be fit for for Saturday. Um, would you would you risk Connor Goldson on, on on this pitch basically? And I suppose the same question goes for for John Suter as well. And and where do you stand? And I, I realize I'm asking about forty five million questions here about the defence, but but where do you stand in the left back position as well? Um, so let's let's go number one. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no Connor Goldson, I would not risk. Um, John Suter is a slightly different one for me because John Suter, as far as we know, has been fit all through pre season. So if there's a risk to be taking, I'm more than happy risking Suter over Goldson because we know Goldson's been knackered the whole preseason. Um, yeah. If there's an option not to play either, then we go for it. I have got no concerns over Leon Balogun and Ben Davies at centre half against. I'm googling this guy's name. Is it Kyle Vassell? I keep thinking yeah, yeah. Darius Vassell, but that's a, that's an old name, that isn't it? Yeah, that's kind of name, right? <laughs> Um, so Kyle Vassell, I don't see I, I don't see Leon Balligan or Ben Davies struggling against that. For left back, <laughs> is it really a question for me? Um, I would not have Borna Barisic anywhere near a Rangers jersey ever again if I could have my way. Um, I actually think back to the last, I don't know if it was the last Kilmarnock game or the one before it, where he got ripped a new one before he got sent off by Daniel Armstrong, was it? And the boy playing right wing for Kelly. Tore Borna to shreds and then stupidly got himself sent off when Bonner was on a booking at that point already. Yeah. So if he's to play, I'd much rather Yilmaz up against him. Um, I don't see Bonner being able to combat that threat of a of a skillful, tricky, pacey winger up against him. So I, I would have Tav, Leon Balligan, Ben Davies and Red Van Yilmaz, assuming all are fit and ready to play. Yeah, that's fair enough. And, and Ben, I've got one last wee question about the defence. Uh, obviously, the left back area for me has been the biggest concern of preseason. I, I take, I totally take all points of view in terms of saying that you know it's preseason. We're there to get minutes into the legs, but it is crunch time on on Saturday now. Do you think there is even a chance of Dujon Sterling featuring at left back uh, at all, or, or, or where do you sit in that? Because I know that when I did the the Sunday pod, I was <laughs> I was fuming with with the way that the left backs have been playing this this season, and um, I, I'd written down Dujon Sterling, and I, I don't know, I, I I maybe still feel that way that if he was fit, I don't see why we shouldn't be sticking him in there. Yeah, I, I would just like him to have had a little bit more football on his legs, um, and 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 they've played with the team during preseason, which which he hasn't. Um, so that that's why I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I don't think he's going to be in there, but I, I can understand why because I I'll be honest with you, with with Yilmaz there and Barisic, like I could toss a coin to be a, be honest at this moment in time of who who have played, and I can see why you would play either of them, um, and I could see why you wouldn't play either of them. So yeah, I could I could understand why you're thinking that, and, and it is something that crossed my mind. But I feel like I feel like he needs that little bit more time with the team and a wee, wee bit more football on his legs to be going into you know an important game now. 
Yeah, that's it. And there's a, a comment here from RFC72. He says, if I see Tav Balogun, Davies, Barisic, I think I'm actually shit myself before the game and watch the game behind the city. I think there's a, a few of us that, that feel not too dissimilar to that. Um, Scott Mitchell, I'll ask you the next question. Um, I, I'm going to guess, I think I know one of your midfield three already, given the fact that you've name-checked them about 45 times in the, on the podcast already. But... Um, who who have you got as your as your midfielders? I, I've automatically assumed it's a, a three, but you know you, you might surprise us. Don't think I'm going to surprise anybody. Um, <laughs> midfield three for me is going to be Nicholas Raskin, um, Kieran Dow, who I think I've name checked about forty times on the pod, um, and then Todd Cantwell. Yeah, and and specifically, why have you picked that three? And another thing, the other question I've got is, have you been happy so far with the fact that Cantwell appears to have been playing a bit more of a deeper position in pre-season than what he has been uh, at the end of last season? Um, so why those three first initially? Um, so Nicholas Raskin just offers that dynamic um, defensive midfielder player that we've been crying out for for years. He's the player that I think Ryan Jack wished he was a few years back. Um, but sadly, he's never going to have the legs to do that again. Um, Kieran Dow for me, just has all aspects to his game. Defensively, looks very, very sound. And going forward, he links the ball and the play really, really well. I think if you look at Lammers goal against Hoffenheim, it's Kieran Dow that's, that kind of creates that by progressing through the lines and playing sharp, uh, short, sharp uh, passes at the edge of the box. Todd Cantwell picks himself for me. I've been happy when playing deeper because it allows those forward players to facilitate a little bit more and get into more spaces. We used to have a situation where a Fedor Morelos would drop deep and almost become a player in the midfield line, and that would, in my opinion, force Cantwell to push himself forward. Yeah. But now you've got Lammers floating about in that 10 area. You've got Danilo or Dessers playing a little bit further forward. So I don't think Todd needs to go out and play as dynamically as he did. But having said that, I do think he's tried a bit hard during preseason. It's maybe shown in a few of the games that he's played. He yeah. maybe just needs to take a wee bit of a back step and realise I don't have to be running 40 yards with this ball and then laying it off. I could just pass it and then get it to players. He needs to trust the players he's got around him because some of these players look like absolute Rolls Royce players. Sam Lammers, I know I've not spoken about him once so far, but I <laughs> could watch that boy play all day long. Tremendous yeah. football player. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point there. You, you've made Scott and, and totally agree with it. Um, ben Marco Negri's eye, and, and I love that name, by the way. He <laughs> says, as long as I don't see Lundstrom anywhere anywhere near that park, sorry, squad. Um, I, you know, uh, first of all, I'll get your midfield three off, or midfield as well off you, and, and do you think we will see Lundstrom? Because, spoiler alert, I have a sneaky suspicion that we might just do that. Uh, well, my midfield is Raskin and Jack with Campwell sort of there when needed, but also being given a bit more freedom to sort of link up with Flammers. Um, so, so I'm sort of a two to a three at, at, at times, but but just sort of given the license for Campwell to be a little bit more expressive than he has maybe been in, in preseason. Um, but uh, yeah, do I think do I think Lundstrom? I think he'll be on the bench, um, and I hope that's where he stays. If I'm honest, at this minute in time. Yeah, yeah, he's not had a great preseason, and um, yeah, that's. I think that's all I've really got to say about John Lundstrom on on that issue there. But um, I'll stick with you, Ben. Here, what's your what's your forward three? Um, so Lammers, as I've already said, um, Danilo ahead of him, and then I have Sima. Um, I think Sima to me, he, he delivers a good ball in, um, and I think he also provides a little bit of pace. And with which which we may need at times, um, which which we don't have really anywhere else. Um, when when we need to try and stretch the game a little bit against the sort of stuffy Kilmarnock side. Um, so I I, I think Lima is a uh, Lima Sima is a good signing. Um, and I think he uh, I think he'll be a good player for us this season. Really do. Yeah, that's that. You are really going to be called a uh, Tom commentator from now on there after that <laughs> one, Ben, which is but a name nobody wants. That's a haircut um, anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, I, I don't think his is a haircut, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Scott, do you agree with, with uh, what Ben said there in, in, in terms of the, the front three? I mean, I, I think, like, as you've touched on earlier on, I, I could watch Lammers play all day long, and, and I've mentioned in previous pods that I think he will be the, the duo Rebo this season in terms of that he'll play like every game possible um so i think in every predicted lineup that i will have sam lammers will be in there um who's your other two 
Um, so definitely, definitely Stammers. Um, I won't have <laughs> Lima in, in my lineup, unfortunately. Um, I've, I've been interested in what I've seen for Abdallah Sima throughout the preseason, but I don't think he's right for this game. I think we go with more a traditional front two, so almost playing this sort of diamond formation um, with Danilo and Dessers up front. I think that's probably the way to go against a, a stuffy Kelly defence um, mm-hmm. and just get Tav and whoever plays left back as high up as possible, get the balls pinged into the box, drop downs for Sam Lammers to dribble by the whole defence, 1-0 Rangers. There you go. Listen, I hope we can just clap that up and just send it out straight after we've beaten them. Um, come on, what was your prediction? 3-1? 3-1. I think they'll get a stuffy goal. Yeah, they, are, they, they always do, these teams, especially especially on that pitch. Um, but Ben, I'll, I'll trouble you for a prediction as well. I'm going 4-2 Rangers. Um, where our defence is at the minute, I can see us conceding. Um, but, but yeah, 4-2. Yeah, I, th- I think that um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get splinters in my bum as well, and I'll just say the same scoreline as, as Scott Mitchell. I'll go for I'll go for three one. I agree with the both of you in terms of I've not been fully convinced with the um, the the defence so far this season, but I think we've got enough firepower up up front. Uh, for what it's worth, I went with uh, Lammers. Uh, Dessers and Seema up front as well and I think we'll see Danilo chucked on towards you know the last 30 maybe second half type thing but um, just before we go Scott Mitchell you've been keeping a wee eye on the, the Genk Servette game for us do you want to give us a wee update and in, to how that's went and how both teams have played yeah over the 90 it's finished 2-2 um, so it's 3 each in aggregate it's going to go to extra time players are currently getting rubbed down by what I hope is a physio on the pitch Um <laughs> It's it's been a weird game. Um, I, I've I've also kept one eye on a few group chats that I'm in, and I've noticed um, Shug, our, our, our very good friend of the pod, has been mentioning that Genk just seem to be throwing balls into their 99 and hoping it stick. That's exactly the way it's been. They're a man up as well, and they're just pumping the ball into the box every every few minutes. Servette, for me, on the deck looked the better team. So, I mean, I, I wanted Servette to go through because I thought they'd be an easier draw, but both of them look difficult. If I'm honest. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll bring you reaction to whoever we, we um, face off in the in the Champions League uh, qualifiers, um, whenever that is. I can't quite remember the dates off the top of my head. But before I go, just a wee couple of uh, bits of housekeeping to do. Uh, if you haven't already seen it, check the interview that our very own Scott Patterson did with Joe Potter. Uh, Joe, Joe Potter, sorry. <laughs> um, at Podcast Studio Glasgow, you know, we're linking up with them. Uh, this season and it's fantastic facilities and, and fantastic to see an interview uh, and, and the, the answers that Joe gave were a fantastic insight into how she's thinking and how the women's team are going to go this year. On that subject, we have a new uh, Twitter for the, is it still called Twitter? Is it X? I don't know what it's going to be called anymore. Well, I'm still calling it Twitter because nobody's told me else uh, otherwise. But we've got, this is Ibrooks RWFC, so give that a follow and we've got one for the B team as well, TII Youth. Um, again, it's been so good getting to tweet all the goals that Thompson the Shaka has been scoring but tonight I just want to say thank you to to both my guests so thank you very much Ben for joining us yes cheers as always and thank you very much Scott Mitchell that was a, a difficult task you had tonight listening to me and keeping an eye on a game of football um, it's been very very interesting I don't know how they do it in this guy's sports studio but I won't be signing up for it anytime soon <laughs> that's exactly but listen as always thanks everybody for all your comments thanks for tuning in and watching and we will be back uh, I'm sure post match after the Kilmarnock game to, to give you a breakdown of that but take care everybody mm-hmm.